Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. Today's episode is sponsored by the University of Tennessee at Martin. UT Martin offers more than 100 academic areas of study within 18 undergraduate degree programs. Contact UT Martin today to find a program that's right for you. Welcome to Real Foot Forward. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Every single week, we here on this podcast explore the people, the culture, and the history of our home right here in West Tennessee, just like we do every single day at our Museum and Heritage Park, Discovery Park of America. Boy, am I excited about this episode's special guest, Dr. Cynthia Bond Hobson. Dr. Hobson is a mentor, an educator, a dynamic speaker, and as we'll hear, she's an author of some really helpful books. So welcome. Thank you. I understand you have written a new book that we're going to talk about you yes. know, in a few minutes. But first, I want to know a little bit about your growing up. You're from Haywood County, is that I right? I am from Stanton, Tennessee. From Stanton. Fantastic. Exactly. So how many brothers and sisters and what did your parents do? And I'm number two of eight. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, my parents, my dad worked at an ice cream factory. Okay. Which made us really very popular. I bet. <laughs> I didn't even realize there was an ice cream factory. Well, in it was Stanton. in. It, it wasn't in Stanton, oh. of course. Uh, it was in Memphis. Okay. And so he and several of the people in our community commuted okay. to Memphis daily. And um, my grandfather, my family's from Haywood County. Okay, where? And well, we. Do you know where Zion Baptist Church is? I do. On, so that's where my family's all around that whole area, Poplar oh. Corner Road. Oh, okay, and, sure. You know, yeah. So my grandfather. Uh, there was a cookie company in Memphis that my grandfather would also commute and work in at the cookie company for I a while. I bet that made you pretty popular, yeah, too. <laughs> Cookies yeah. all the time. <laughs> and then my other grandfather helped build a Pringles factory oh, in okay. Paris, I think it was, or somewhere like that. Jackson. I can't, in ja- is that where it was? Jackson, okay. Yeah. So he did that. So anyway, he had all those Pringle cans everywhere. Wow. Um, so um, so growing up, you did, did it's hard oh, to bring I grew, ice cream. I grew up that. on a farm, okay. on a farm. Uh, my dad's main job, I think he would say, would be as uh, was as a farmer, but that was his public job that he worked in Memphis at the um, ice cream plant. Very cool. And he always had on uh, white overalls and a white hat that said, John on the on the uh, <laughs> on the test, so everybody always knew his name. And he was a big guy. He had these hands that were like the size of a baseball glove. It seemed he was about six four. So people called him Big John. Or oh, that's great! What big, a great not memory. not Big Bad John, but just yeah. Big John. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so in Stanton. So my dad, until recently, was the pastor of the uh, Stanton Baptist Church. Really? There. Um, and so I've been to Stanton. Uh, many many times many many times yeah where where was um, in relationship to the s- church um, I come from the Douglas community okay and it's an it's an interesting kind of story about the Douglas community and I didn't realize it had such a historical piece to it uh, when I was growing up well my great aunt and uncle raised me okay you know raised me yeah uh, but my parents lived in the same community and so I stayed with my great aunt and uncle and my great grandmother in one house and then I'd go to my parents house and hang out all the time but um, they were referred to, they would refer to the place where my parents lived as the government farm and I didn't know what that meant but anyway as I grew up, uh, in that community, what it is, it was a government experiment in the 30s. And what they did was they came in and they built 38 or 39 new homes and carefully screened African American families who could buy this property. And each piece of property had um, anywhere between 80 or 90. Uh, acres of land. Wow. So they built a new home and a smokehouse, and they equipped each one with this, that, or the other. And then they built a new school in the middle of the community because at that time there were no schools close by. And my first grade teacher taught first grade for 43 years, same school. Wow. And she talked about how in 1938, when they were building this school, and they got it up, people would come from miles around because they had never seen a new school for African-American children. Wow. 
And that school was in existence up until about 1987. And so now it's a community center. But the Douglas community, um, from what I'm understanding, the the experiment was to see what would happen with families Mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. And it's really pretty exciting that most of the land that uh, those African-American families had back in the 30s, they still own. Wow. Or their descendants do. And the thing that's so powerful about that Douglas community was during the 60s, the late 50s and 60s, when they were trying to do voter registration, because there was this cadre of landowners. They were able to affect some change mm-hmm. with that movement, because if you will recall, many of the families who registered to vote were evicted from their homes during the winter of 1959, 60, 61, were evicted from their homes and had nowhere to go. And they lived in tents and it caused national attention because you hear these people who are just trying to register to vote, but mm-hmm. they've been evicted and they're living outside in the winter. But because there were these homeowners in that one particular area, they were able to do what they needed to do. If that meant go and stand in line to get registered every day for months, uh, they were able to do that because they own their own land. And so it's a really pretty powerful story. So that's where I come from. And there were always different kinds of people in our home um, because the northern uh, agitators, as they were called, uh, usually uh, college students from the north and uh, whites who came to uh, help African Americans get registered to vote, they had to stay somewhere. So they stayed in people's homes. And so there were there were always people in my home. And so that must have greatly influenced you. It did. Where you ended up today. It, it, it absolutely did, because what it showed me was that people are people are people, and kindness goes a long way. It doesn't matter what color people are. And because so many of the white people in Haywood County were kind of hateful, and it was a wonderful thing to see. That here are some other people, though, on the other side of the spectrum who are also white, but they're not mean and nasty, and they're not burning crosses in your yard and all that kind of thing. So... Um, I think it had an amazing effect without me even realizing that that was something that everybody wasn't handling. Right. So Right. You were exposed to something that a lot of people, the majority of people didn't see. Well, I tell you, my earliest remembrances are of being dragged <laughs> And I say dragged because I I think I was sick because I'm I, I can't figure why I wasn't at school. But I remember being dragged to a rally with uh, uh, an agitation rally, I guess I'd call it, where they were talking about strategies and plans and singing. I ain't letting nobody turn me around. Yeah. And so that's that's the lens that I see so many things from. But I, I I'm happy that my parents were people who taught me that color has nothing to do with somebody's heart. If they're going to be good people, they're going to be good people. And I taught my children that if they have to define their friends by color, they probably aren't their friends. (laughs) You know, it's like, oh, my white friend did this or my Hispanic. If you have to define them by the color. Yeah. I I, I just think that won't hold water. I just don't. So so you um, were living through all of that. And then at some point. You decided to go away to be to college and to pursue your own, you know, what, how did you, where did you end up and how did you get there? Oh, I took the yellow brick road, I do believe. Because <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you this before you tell me that. So you eventually, in your, in your life story, this is a spoiler alert, you're going to teach journalism at the University of Memphis, if I'm correct. <laughs> that is correct. And I was a journalism major at the University of Memphis. Were you there then? So, well, I, 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 we need I don't to figure... Think, we, I don't think you're that old, we, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm old. We need to figure that out. <laughs> I graduated in 1989. Okay, okay, yeah, you were there. Okay. So, I wasn't there then, okay. but uh, I was at... Memphis between 1995 and 2005. Okay, okay. So, so let's back up and start off with where, how you, how you, uh, where, where did you end up going and how'd you get there? Well, I, I went to Drums Business College right out of high school. Um, and I was a pretty good secretary. And, w- and what was your goal when you went there? Did you I, have a I plan? Just, no, I didn't have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to be grown. You know, when people say, well, what did you want to be when you grew up? I just wanted to be grown. I don't know what I wanted to be. But anyway, I was a secretary. I, I worked for a year at the University of uh, Tennessee at Martin. 
and okay. met my husband, and we got married and moved to Dyersburg, Tennessee. Okay. And uh, then in 1982, he said he had received a call to the ministry. And so we moved to Atlanta. Now, now well, how did you take that? Did, let, 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 me, let me back up, because yeah. 1980 was really pretty pivotal. Um, I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. Mm-hmm. And I had turned 25, and I thought, okay, what I, what I need is a career. And I thought, okay, well, what do you know how to do? I was like, well, okay, I don't know what I know how to do. I know how to be a secretary, but that wasn't what I really wanted to be when I grew up. And so it was interesting. There was a couple who came to our house that Sunday afternoon, and I said to the young woman, so what do you do? And she said, well, uh, she was in college, and she was a journalism major. And I was like, well, what do you do with that? (laughs) And she said, well, you know, she writes, and she's going to do blah, 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 blah. I thought, well, that sounds kind of like fun. So anyway, I went to the uh, careers office at Dyersburg State that week, and the counselor said, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I don't know. I want to do something in journalism. And she said, well, what do you have in mind? I thought, I don't know. <laughs> and I, I, I really didn't know. And so we decided because I like people, I like to talk, then maybe journalism would be a good thing for me to do. Uh-huh. So I worked at the First Citizens Bank in Dyersburg. And everybody has to have money. So you know, I knew lots of people because everybody had to have money. Mm-hmm. And so the... Um, I guess he was a program director at uh, WASLWTRO, came in. And I said, I'd like to come to work for you at the radio station. He says, have you ever been in a radio station? I thought, what does one thing have to do with, <laughs> do with the other? But he said, show up Sunday morning at 6 a.m. And you know he was not expecting me to show up Sunday morning at 6 a.m. But I did. Mm-hmm. And as they say in the rest, it's history. Mm-hmm. So you showed up. I show, you know what? I, that's half the mouth every that's time. Right. Show you, up. You got to show up. That's you got to right. show up. So um, when we were going to move to uh, Atlanta... I was trying to do some extra work so I could uh, make sure we were debt-free by the time we moved because we were both going to be students because I was going to do undergrad and he was going to do seminary. And so I was working. I I had my own show, uh, Sunday nights, middle of the road, kind of a, adult contemporary kind of music. And I don't know why I was at work that particular day, but somebody who worked AM didn't show up. And the way this worked was that there was an FM station where I worked, that was like adult contemporary. But then uh, TRO was country. And so somebody didn't show up. And so I said, <laughs> I, I, I'll do it. And they looked at me like, yeah, okay, sure you will. But I've been listening to Charlie Rich since I was a kid. So, uh-huh. you know, it's like, uh-huh. okay, I can do this. So uh, they let me try the board doing country, and I loved it. And thus started a love affair that – still exist. Um, I was in the last Merle Haggard concert at the Ryman, standing oh. room only, you know, so it's it's yeah. just like, okay, I do a pretty mean George Jones impression too. <laughs> I, I, I won't do it for you to say, but um, so we moved to Atlanta and I went to Clark College. Uh, it's one of the 11 historically black colleges mm-hmm. that are related to the United Methodist Church. And is it's, that your husband was a Methodist? Yes, okay. we were United Methodists. Okay. We so, still are. So when he was called, he was called to the being a Methodist minister. Yes. And so I, I started at Clark uh, when I was 26. And it was really weird because some of my professors were about the same age as I was. And I thought, now, if they had been in my high school, they would have sat right <laughs> behind me. But anyway, um, so he had a three-year term with seminary. And so I told the advisor, okay, I have to be gone in three years flat and make sure you map me from point A to point Z, because when he's ready to go, I have to be ready to go as well. So I did undergrad uh, in three years so that we could keep it moving. And then we moved to Paris, Tennessee, home of the world's biggest fish fry. That's right. And And the Eiffel Tower. (laughs) The Eiffel Tower wasn't it wasn't, there yet? It, it, wasn't okay. it hadn't come yet. Okay. Um, so when we got to Paris, I worked at one of the local radio stations in the news department and had a ball with that. But our children were small. We have two children. Our children were small at the time. And one night I had been at that budget meeting and, you know, one of those small rooms with lots of smoke and all that kind of stuff. And I came in and I, I felt like I had enough a cigarette smoke on the top of me to just pick it up 
and take it off. And one of my children says, Mama, we don't ever see you. Oh. Yeah. So it, it became painfully obvious to me that I needed to find something to do with myself that did not require me being away from home at night and all kinds of places and all that. So I was uh, I went back to banking. Uh, I was a bank teller and I was a really good bank teller. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to take over the bank. I might oh. as well tell the truth. <laughs> and I kept trying to get them to cross-train me to do something more than run the drive through and be the vault teller. And that wasn't working. So I had been praying. Mm -hmm. I had been trying to um, get into grad school. And I don't know. I couldn't get my ends tied. I just couldn't get them tied. And so... This is the fall of 1987 by this time, and I had tried and I had tried to get my ends tied, and I couldn't. But then this time, we had this house in Dyersburg that we had left behind when we moved to Atlanta. So we had a contract on the house. I had checked. I could get student loans so we could afford me to go to graduate school. And so I quit my job at the bank. and You took a leap of faith. Listen, the Lord told the Lord told me to go. And so I quit my job and enrolled at Murray State, got a grad assistantship for three hundred dollars a month, was cruising right along. So this is September. Everything's pretty good till October comes and yeah, it's getting time to start paying your bills and it's like, oh, okay. So I come home from school this day. We had two letters, one from the realtor that said that contract we thought we had on your house fell through. Oh. And so we're not going to sell that house. And then the other one was from the student loan people that said, you know, we thought you were eligible for that for that student loan, but, you, but you're not. Oh, and man. so I'm in the kitchen. I'm in the kitchen having the meltdown. I bet. It's like, okay, now, Lord, we had this talk. And you told me, right. <laughs> you told me to go. And I went. So now what are we going to do? And the darndest thing, to tell you how the Lord works. So I go to the door, because by this time, Roger is a pastor at the Wiley and New Hope and St. Paul Charge, three churches in, in the Paris area. And so one of our neighbors, Fred Tharp, was at the door. And like I said, I was in the kitchen having a meltdown, so I had to go to the door, so I had to get myself together. So he said, well, Sister Hodgson... I thought you might be having a bad day. And I'm thinking, okay, who told you? <laughs> and he said, I brought you some turnip greens. And I said, Fred, thank you so much. And I hugged him and he left. But to tell you how the Lord works, I go in the kitchen. He has brought me this bag of turnip greens that he has picked and he has washed them. And then he has put a piece of fat back at the bottom of the bag. And I heard the Lord say to me, now, what part of I got this did you miss? You know, if I can take care of the sparrow, I got you. Mm -hmm. I got this. And it was the most amazing thing in that two years that I was a graduate student, we had more than when I worked full time, two or three jobs. And it was just like, look at God. Yeah. Look at God. And Roger had asked me when I told him I was going to I, I was going to go to grad school. Well, what are you going to do with the degree? I thought, I don't know. The Lord just told me to go. So we uh, were getting ready. To, I was getting ready to graduate. And so uh, we were getting ready to move to Jackson because he was getting a new appointment. And I applied to the Jackson Sun, to all the colleges, the radio stations, I got all rejection letters except one. I had applied for a teaching job at Lane College. I was on the children's sermon one Sunday at church, and Rosemary Bigham, who was who was from Martin and was uh, a seasoned teacher and was somebody that I respected, and she said to me, you know, I think you have a gift for teaching. Hmm. And I looked at her like she had three years because <laughs> I had no intention of teaching. Yeah. And... She said, I, but I think you have a gift for that. So I thought, okay, well, she thinks I have a gift. I'll just apply for teaching jobs. And so everybody rejected me except Lane College. And I, okay, so I called all the people I knew who had 
ties to um, Lane College and because they said they might have it open. Oh. I harassed those poor people the whole <laughs> summer because I thought, okay, if you might have one, do you know yet? Do you know yet? And so finally they gave me <laughs> they gave me a job. And the first day I walked into my classroom, I knew that was where I belonged. Oh wow. That's a great feeling, isn't it? Oh. <sighs> It was it was it was it was just like I had gone through all these other places, people and things to come to that place. Mm -hmm. And every time I walked in my classroom, I understood that it was a privilege. Yeah, because I know for a fact to teach is to touch a life forever because I have teachers that I still love and keep in touch with. And I have students who send me cookies. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what, what were you teaching? I was teaching um, public relations kinds of things and journalism kinds of things okay. at, at Lane College. Yeah. And um, the chair of the department at Murray State called about two years in and said, so have you gotten your doctorate yet? And I'm saying, I just got finished with that master's <laughs> degree. You know, I don't have time. And that I, is hard, hard oh, work. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Listen. So I said, no, I have not started <laughs> working on my doctoral degree. And so he called again and said, so have you started working? I no, I have not. So he said, well, I tell you what, come and work for me at Murray, and and we will uh, help you get your doctoral degree. But we had just gotten, we had just moved from Paris, that's 22 miles away from Murray, to Jackson. And so I said, you do understand, I live an hour and 40 minutes yeah. away. And he said, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. So they gave me a three-day teaching schedule uh, so I could start my doctoral studies. And seven years, nine months, 21 days, and four hours later. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that you're counting or <laughs> I was counting. Because the first three or four years, uh, I enjoyed it. Yeah. And then that other three years, nine months, 21 days, and four hours, I... <laughs> And what what was that in what journalism? I got the last pure journalism degree they gave it, uh, Southern wow. Illinois at Carbondale. Okay. They turned it into uh, mass media, some 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 okay. some else. But anyway, I what got, was your thesis on? I'm always interested. But in you that. know that's interesting that you would ask because I was trying to figure out what I wanted to write about, and nobody had ever asked me what am I interested in. They just gave me an assignment. I did it or didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Either way, mm -hmm. um, so I started. I started looking at how women and people of color were covered in the Brownsville States graphic. That was where I started. And that led me to uh, a project that I now call the Women of Haywood because I started doing oral history interviews with professional African-American women because— I didn't know enough about them. I didn't really know any except my first grade teacher, who had been the only college-educated woman in our whole community. But to watch how she transformed that community, I mean, if there was anything positive or anything good that went on in that community, Mamie Dale Reeves Bowles Dotson was part mm -hmm. of it. She had instigated it. She had carried it all the way through, you know, like the Easter seals and the Red Cross and the heart, in anything and everything, presents for the patients at Western Mental, just phenomenal. And so I wanted to hear her story. And so I started doing these oral history interviews with these professional African-American women. Uh, some of them I knew, some of them I didn't. And so uh, my friend Cynthia Bond uh, helped build the bridge to the women that I didn't know. And that project eventually became the book called The Women of Haywood, Their Lives. Which is I, on my bookshelf. Yay. Home. I have a copy of that. Yay. Um, I, th I think it should be on every bookshelf in the world. I do. And maybe not the whole world, but at, <laughs> at least in Haywood County, because yeah. the lessons that those women taught and lived are so very powerful. Mm -hmm. And so I was looking in the, I was reading the Brownsville paper to see how women and people of color were covered, if they were covered at all. And it seemed like all colored people did was get in trouble and raise ruckus and so forth. And so I started trying to help my, the chair of my a dissertation, understand that something historically significant had happened in Haywood County. And I, I, was, I was doing very poorly at convincing him that this was a topic that really had some historical significance. And one of my friends, Dr. Lightumbe Echo, 
who was from Cameroon, told me, well, look at the New York Times. And I said, why would I look at the New York Times about what happened in Haywood County? And he said, well, you know, the local papers did not cover a lot of the things that went on locally because it was unsafe. But the regional and the national newspapers did. It was the darndest thing. I looked, and sure enough, the New York Times, the Washington Post, a lot of information was in there about what was going on in Haywood County. And the interesting thing, if you read the Brownsville paper, either the the African Americans were causing trouble or there was a new organist at the First Methodist Church. I mean, it was it was just like everything was fine. Nothing nothing extra was going right. on, even though all of these evictions and the marches and all this kind of stuff was going on, there was very little coverage. Yeah, it was the Brownsville archives that you were using, was it at the library mm-hmm. there? That I've been spent many times in that. In they've that got room. they've got great resources. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, there was a lady that uh, really collected a lot of stories and put them in the filing cabinets up against the wall. Who has since passed away, but there's really great resources there. Yeah, great which resources. You're absolutely right. Um, so you started you started pulling that information from the other newspapers and and sure enough, I had enough information to. Uh, to gather and show that this research was important because what they had been showing before was that it was safe for the regional and the national newspapers to cover what was going on somewhere far away where the local paper had to be really very careful. They couldn't afford to make the uh, advertisers angry Mm -hmm. because then they would pull their ads. And so they, they were just, going on with business as usual. The okra queen was ruling and so yeah. forth. Yeah. So um it was it was it was a fascinating piece of work. But I think the best advice I got uh from an advisor along the way was find something you're gonna always be interested in yeah. because it's going to be with you a really long time. Mm-hmm. Cause I got sick of it by oh, by yeah. by that fourth hour. Yeah, let me tell you. It's a it's a long haul. Well, I don't think most people take seven years, nine months, 21 days. Of course, my husband says I should tell the whole world world that I wasn't just working on that doctoral degree full time. I had a full time job. I had a husband. I had two children yeah. and I was doing all the other things, too. Right. So, yeah. But still, seven years, nine months, <laughs> yeah, 21 but you, but days and four out. hours. You made it. You stuck to it. I had, had to. tenacity. My grandmother. Clara Jones Bond, I can hear her in my mind. Every time I wanted to give up, and to tell you how powerful those four women were that I did the interviews with, they had some of the most powerful stories about the sacrifices that their parents had made for them to have an education, all the things they had had to do, all the all the obstacles they had to go over. And so they haunted me. They mm-hmm. absolutely haunted me. Every time I wanted to pull over on the side of the road and just cry or turn around and go home, I heard them. Mm. I heard them. I heard their stories. And I thought, why am I whining? What 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 am I complaining about? And so I'd push on a little bit more. But my grandmother would repeat this often. Once a task is begun, never leave it until it's done. Be the task great or small, you do it well or not at all. And I'm not a quitter, even though there were so many times I wanted to quit. But I couldn't. I, I, I could not quit. I I could hear her. I could hear them and their hopes and dreams. But it was really funny. Mrs. Rawls, Mrs. Eva James Davis Rawls was a registered nurse. And she was one of the, she is one of the women of Haywood. And uh, her niece, Cynthia Bond, had uh, built me a bridge to Mrs. Rawls. And I didn't know her. I knew who she was, but I didn't know her. And so I showed up that Tuesday night, and I had come from class that day. So I had on some jeans and a sweatshirt. And so she opened the door and she let me in. And we did the interview, two hours worth of interview. And I had brought some new equipment. You know, there was nothing on the tape. Oh, wow. <laughs> we got finished. There was nothing on Everybody's that. Everybody's been there. Oh, it's a terrible, been there, done terrible that. feeling. Do do not. Do yeah. not take new equipment anywhere. Yeah. Anywhere, ever. Luke's pro- Luke, have you ever done that? He, he's... Um... <laughs> <laughs> he records that so far all of our podcasts have turned out on the tape so he he must not have done that well like i said the the lesson for today don't ever uh-uh. don't ever take new equipment so yeah. we got to the end of the interview tuesday night 
nothing, absolutely nothing on the tape. So then I had to say, Mrs. Walls, would you mind if I come back on Thursday and we'll do it again? And she said, oh, baby, that's all right. You come on back. So when I came back on Thursday, I came from work. So I had, oh. you know, I was all dressed up and she opened the front door and she said, no, baby, that's how I like to see you look. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the lesson I could teach my students was pay attention to your audience. Uh-huh. That's right. You know, if you mean business and you want to be taken seriously, don't go in there with your raggedy jeans and your sweatshirt on. Yeah. My jeans weren't raggedy, but <laughs> she said, now, that's how I like to see you look. So I never, ever go anywhere with older people and I don't get dressed up, <laughs> you know, with hoes and heels and <laughs> all now, the whole getting you, caboodle. So you, you published that, but you've published about 13, 14 No, books only eight. Eight. So you've published eight books. Only eight. Um, in, in between that time and your and your latest book. But first I want to hit the University of Memphis because uh, we were both there. I don't know if Dr. Um, Spielberger was there at the time. And absolutely. Dr. Sandra Utt. Um, was I think Dr. Ud came with the building. Yeah, <laughs> well, she's she's retired now. So, really? Yeah. yeah, she retired last year. So okay. Yeah, and and Dr. S- Dr. Spielberger passed away. So right. But uh, you know, like I loved. I, I was the same way you were. I didn't know where I belonged until I hit that building. And when I hit that building, it was just like, ah, oh, this is where I'm supposed oh, to be. It's a wonderful place. Yeah, yeah. So so you, t- how long did you teach at the University of Memphis? I was at the University of Memphis for ten and a half years. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's that was longer than I had been anywhere except on Earth. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and so um, now um, you've. I want to make sure we have plenty of time to talk about your most recent book. Um, tell tell me about that. Well, it's called Totally Graceful, and it's a collection of columns and blogs that I did over the past couple of years. Um, I never set out to write books. I was minding my own business as I am, as I am prone to do, but my sister, child number one, is a sociologist, and so she encouraged me to collect the columns that I was writing about growing up in Haywood County, mm-hmm. and do something with them. And I said, "Like what?" And she said, "Well, why don't you make a book because there are no other histories of our community available?" And so I thought, oh, "Okay." So I was, I was working on my dissertation becoming a book at the time, and it's called Times of Challenge and Controversy, uh, Voter Registration in Haywood County, 1960, 1961, regional and national coverage. Or, it has some long title to mm-hmm. it, but anyway. So I, was, I, was, I had just started working on the second book. And I was at my desk on Wednesday, minding my own business as I am prone to do, and The Lord said to me, go ahead and call the Brownsville paper about collecting these columns. And I was like, Lord, I just got started on this one. And the Lord said to me, so what part of do is I said, do, did you, (laughs) did you miss? And so I said, oh, okay. So I called the Brownsville paper and asked uh, who the publisher was so I could write and ask about collecting the columns. So I wrote a letter that said, I'd really like to collect the columns that I've written in this in your newspaper and make a book. May I have permission to do so? So this is Wednesday. So I get up, I go outside, put that letter in the mailbox on Wednesday. So Monday I get this enthusiastic letter from the publisher that says, oh, yes, we would love it if you do that. And we'll buy the first copy and we'll hook you up with a printer. That became Wiggle Tales. And that was my first book. And I would get really great comments from people when I would write the columns because I used to write one every, I guess it couldn't have been every week because I I can't think of that many things. But um, (laughs) I was writing the columns called Hobson's Haywood. I was writing the columns on a regular basis. And then we must have moved, I guess. And so I started writing uh, just like for Thanksgiving or if somebody died or something like that. Mm -hmm. So... Um, she hooked me up with uh, Main Street Printers in Jackson and did the first book. And I felt like after I finally, finally got finished a doctoral degree, I had learned some lessons that needed to be shared, but I couldn't decide who needed to know it. And so I called it Rules of Engagement. 
and I was talking. You know, it's amazing to me how the Lord works. I'm talking to one of my friends, and she said, so what are you doing? I said, well, I'm trying to find somebody to publish a book for me. And so she said, well, call so-and-so at so-and-so place because that's his job. He's looking for authors. And I was like, oh. Okay, so I pitched what became Bad Hair Days, Rainy Days, and Mondays, Wisdom and Encouragement to to, to Lift a Woman's Spirit, uh, to Abingdon Press as part of the United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really crazy about that title because I had been calling my book. Its working title was Rules of Engagement. Mm -hmm. And they said, but it's a fun book. Why would you give it such a boring name? (laughs) And I said, because I like that name. And they were like, okay, well, we like Bad Hair Days, Rainy Days, and Mondays, and we're going to call it that. And I was like, I don't know if I like that. And they were like, well... You either take this title That's right. and we publish it, or you don't and we don't. Yeah, I said, like, "Oh, you know, I really like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, I really, I really like that the title." The publisher always wins when it <laughs> came to the name of the book. Yeah, they do kind of have yeah. the power. Yeah. They do, and so uh, "Bad Hair Days, Rainy Days, and Mondays" was mm-hmm. a big hit. And so they said, "Okay, so w- what's next?" And I was like, "Oh, I don't know. I told you everything I know in that book." And my husband said, "I doubt that." So anyway, I started working on what became Too Many Hours in the Fire, and they're all smoking. That's that's autobiographical, (laughs) because I I had way too many things going. But that that one was a hit as well. But our son got married 20 years ago now, and I felt like we had learned an awful lot as a couple, and I wanted to make sure he could be successful, he and his wife could be successful. So I um, fixed him with this little book that had all the lessons I thought they would need to learn and gave it to them. And so I was saying to my husband that I really wanted to do something more with that. So he says, well, I'll help. So we started working on this book of devotions for couples, no, for newlyweds. And the Abingdon people said, well, what about newlyweds and couples? And I said, Oh, okay, I guess. So that became I do dot, dot, dot every day. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wisdom for newlyweds and not so newlyweds. Mm. And I'm just really tickled about that because it's still doing very well. It's a great gift for couples. And we're really pretty honest and lay lots of stuff out there. We, you know, we don't get x-rayed or anything like that. But um, <laughs> well, just, he's a Methodist minister. Yeah, too, right? so he has yeah. to keep his reputation yeah. in, intact. But we're trying to remind people that marriage is a precious gift from God. And you have to invest in that. You have to work at marriage. It's, it's like a job. You have to work at it if you want it to be what God intended. And so... I did three books with Abingdon Press, and then I did this book called It's 31 is 30 Wonderful, uh, because the books of devotions are 31, one for every day. And this 31 is 30 Wonderful is a prayer and reflection journal for women. And basically what I'm asking women to do is just get somewhere and be still. 31 minutes for 31 days and see if the Lord has not helped you move yourself to a different kind of place. And so that was my next one. And back to the women of Haywood. I did those interviews uh, maybe 1995, 93, 95. And those women haunted me because I had said, well, you know, I might make a book. But I hadn't done a thing with those interviews except I had gotten them transcribed, but they were just kind of back there on the shelf, just minding their own business, haunting me. And so they started dying, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were old women to begin with. Yeah. Let me let me be clear. They were old women. Yeah. when I, You know, the oldest one, I think, was born in 1914. Wow. And then the youngest of them was maybe 1919. So they were already old women when I started. And uh, they started dying. And I thought, OK, let me do this. And I went to this workshop that Dan Miller, uh, who is um, an inspirational kind of guy who lives over in Franklin. And it was called Write, W-R-I-T, to the bank. And all these people were in there and they were talking about how they were reading all these books and they were writing all these books. I'm thinking, what are they having time to do all this stuff? 
And I realized that the reason I didn't have time to read and write is because I was, listen, I had my TV shows on Monday. I had them all lined up. I had some for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So I was wasting a whole bunch of time that I could have been doing something else. And so on my way home from that um, event, I decided that what I would do when I got home was to have Mondays for reading and then Wednesday for writing. And then Friday, I would do some reflection because I wasn't doing any of that. I was just talking about, oh, I really want to write a book. I really want to write a book, but I wasn't writing any I mean, books. so many people say, I really want to write a book. Oh, gosh. You know, it, 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 everybody says that. They tell me that. And I said, well, have you started? That's right. No. Well, do you know what you want? to write about no I was like okay well see I just keep thinking back to w- when you sat in the bank and you know the guy said do you want to show do you want to come you know and see the rate and, and come to at six and you showed up exactly so, I mean I think that's what a lot of people say they want to write a book but they don't show up well I say write a page a day even if it's no good even if it's about 25 different things at least you have something to work with and I guarantee if you write something every day. You're going to have something that makes sense, something that you're going to be passionate about. And so I encourage people to write all the time. And the things you're talking about, I'm sure are going to make some of the folks listening want to go buy some of your books. So they're all on Amazon, I I, I sure hope so. (laughs) They're on Amazon. They're on Amazon. And and you have a blog. I have Um, a blog, drbonhopson.com. Mm-hmm. And you can read all of your uh, blog. You you're using new media very effectively. Oh you're, yeah, I'm you're so out excited. There posting, I'm posting um, in a serious kind of way. Yep. Yeah. And how long ago did this most recent book come out? July. Okay. Uh, 2019. But I got to tell you how this happened. Yeah. So when I worked at the University of Memphis, the day one, uh, I would talk to the students about the syllabus, and I'd tell them, "Okay, there is such a thing as a free lunch." Everybody will tell you. There are no such things as free lunch. I said, yeah, this time there is. And I said, I owe you lunch. You get to pick the place. I'll take you anywhere you want to go. You have to take me. I'm not giving you the money. You have to take me. And I said, um, when you graduate, you come by and let me know that it's time and I'll take you anywhere you want to go for lunch. It might have a little bit of a string to it because when you're rich and famous, you owe me lunch. (laughs) And so over the years, I've had the most wonderful time having lunch with my students when they graduate. And so I'm trying to think, have I had more than two lunches? Oh, interesting. Yeah. But anyway, I had one of my former colleagues at the University of Memphis, Dr. Uh David Arant, called and said that, one of my students was looking for me for my free lunch. And I was like, really? <laughs> so <laughs> I was so excited. So I found her and she was telling me, uh, Leah Stanley is her name. And she was telling me that she had written a book about taking care of her grandparents. Both of them had Alzheimer's or uh, dementia. And so she was going to have her first book published. And she thought it was time for me to have my free lunch. And so as she was telling me about her publisher, Anovo. It's um, a private one in Collierville. Um, I thought, hmm, so I should call? And she said, oh, yeah, you would love working with them. And so I did. And it's a ministry-driven publisher. Mm -hmm. And we were on the same page with the ministry that I was trying to do and that they were trying to do. And so it was such a delight working with them to do Totally Graceful. It's a collection of columns. It's a wisdom for phenomenal and grace-filled women. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's been out since July. We've not done much promoting until just lately. And so trying to get it out there so people will understand that it's there and that women will be blessed by it. I mean, anybody can read it, but it (laughs) is designed for women. Uh, And I finally found my niche. I think that's that's women. And I've been blessed to touch young women, uh, women in the middle, older women, um, because our hopes and dreams are pretty much the same. We all want to be happy. We want our families to be well, and we want to be safe. So... Well, you definitely have taken taken showing up and <laughs> showed up over and over and over again and turned it into a wonderful career that I'm sure you're touching literally thousands of men and women, you know, with what you're sharing. So I know many, many people appreciate it. And I could just sit here and listen to you tell stories all day long. You are a natural <laughs> storyteller. Well, um, I'm, I'm, I've got a suggestion. I think you need to write a book about the government farm. Um 
I think that would be amazing. Well, I think it would be amazing, too, because to see how that investment, and that's what I'm going right. to call it, it's an investment, uh, has blessed the world, really, because people from Haywood County will tell you there's something special about those folk who come from the Douglas community. And and the thing that I love about it is that there were whole families. I mean, right. they were carefully screened. And yeah. so you had people who were all on the same page. I mean, they had a really strong PTA. And, and that material must exist somewhere. It in, must. In, like um, in the Library of Congress, maybe. Or, I'm guessing. You know, and um, so you would have something to pull from, lots of family photographs. I'm sure. You know, and then you could track down. Anyway, I'll be the first in line to, to buy that book <laughs> when you write that okay, one. Okay, I'm loving it. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things I had started uh, before I left the University of Memphis, I had this computer assisted reporting class that I knew I wasn't good at. And I hope the students didn't notice, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure they did because they always know more than you do. <laughs> but my great aunt mom who was collecting, oh, she collected everything on earth, but she had these funeral programs. Oh. And I don't oh, know wow. how much you know about African-American yeah, funerals, sure. but it's it's a production. It's, yeah. it's, it's a production. And mm-hmm. so she had been collecting these funeral programs ever since I was a child. And so I asked her one day when I was on my way home. I moved to Jackson by this time because when I first started working at the University of Memphis, I lived in Paris, Tennessee, home of the world's biggest fish fry, two hours and a half away, whether you're driving 85 or 55, same two hours and a half. (laughs) And so I said, what did you do with those funeral programs? And she said, oh, they're in there in a box. And so I went and got this box and I said, I thought you had a whole lot more. And she said, oh, there are a whole bunch in there. So I took them home, started sorting at about 11 o'clock. That Thursday night, Friday morning at eight o'clock, I was still sorting. Wow. And what I did was I alphabetized the funeral programs and put them in loose leaf binders so that I had 28, I think, and gave each one to my students. Mm. And what we did was um, use the computer assisted reporting, uh, Mm -hmm. computer assisted uh, tech. Uh, techniques to um, look at when people were born, what kind of work they did, Mm -hmm. if they went to church, what kind of things happened at their funeral. And it was the most amazing teaching I think I've ever done because it offered me an opportunity to teach at at a deeper level than I would have before. So if everybody was having their funeral Saturday at one o'clock, there was a reason. It wasn't just because they didn't have anything else to do on Saturday. It was because African-American people tend to define family much, much broader so that when you go to a funeral, you'll have a whole bunch of folks. You cannot explain to anybody how they're kin to you. They're mm-hmm. family folks. Yeah. And so if if person A dies, all the family folk have to come from wherever they have to come from, but they have to get off work yeah. Friday night and have to drive all night to get there mm-hmm. Saturday by one o'clock. Right. And so it was it was fascinating the kinds of questions that the students could ask and that I could answer. And because she had collected all these programs, mainly from our community, I knew most of the people who had lived and died. And I said to the students, look at your notebook and find one person that you want to know something more about. And you'll have to do an interview with that person's family to see what kind of impact or what they did or what kind of person they were. And my students went from, okay, looking at their watch five minutes in to I'm literally having to beat them out the room to make them leave. And they got so involved with these people and these families. And it's a project that's called From the Cradle to the Grave. And I'm really delighted that John Ashworth from Brownsville scanned them all in. Yeah. There's 775. Good, <laughs> That's like insane. she said, there was a whole bunch in that box. But what a great resource! Though, oh, absolutely. So it's online, and so if you put in "from the cradle to the grave," okay. Haywood County, or something like that, okay. they'll pop up. And so if you're wondering about your uncle Bud, yeah, uh, there what will, a resource! Oh, it's the most amazing. It's about go, the most amazing work I've done. I'm going to go check that out. <laughs> and I, you know, I have a I have a blog about Haywood County history. And so I'm going to write something up about that. Well, and like I said, I'm, 
it's, fascinated. It's, it's wonderful. It's um, and the volumes are at the Carver Dunbar Museum, okay. uh, so you can actually go and and look at them. But seven hundred and seventy. That's amazing. Seven hundred. It has been so nice having you here. I feel well, like I have a new friend. Well, you do. Thank you. But but I was talking to my sister last night about about you, and mm-hmm. she said, "Well, who are his people?" I thought that's 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 our grandmother's favorite question when when you <laughs> bring somebody people. home. Now, who are you, who are your people, baby? Yeah. So um, I said, I don't know, but I'll make sure I ask. So yeah, you can uh, go online and see who all my people are because I've got them all on there. So it was such it. a delight. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. I want to put in a plug for the Black yes. College Fund, the United Methodist Church. The United Methodist Church has a hundred and. 16, I think at this point, schools, colleges, and universities, and 11 of them are historically black colleges. We have more than anybody else. And that's been my work for the last 15 years. And so it's my opportunity to give back to uh, the school. My, My alma mater is Clark Atlanta University at this point, but it's my opportunity, I think, to pay back the people called United Methodists who have invested Seven years, nine months, 21 days, plus an undergrad and a master's degree. Um, They did that for me. We'll put a link to the show notes as well. Okay, great. To help let people know about it. Thank you very kindly. You are welcome. Thank you all so much for having me. And now Andrew Gibson is taking us behind the scenes at Discovery Park of America to see what we may be able to discover today. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Gibson. I'm with the Education Department here at beautiful Discovery Park of America. And today I'm with Zach Gray, Education Specialist here at the park, who will be sharing with us more about Camp Tyson, uh, located here in Tennessee, uh, some some Tennessee history here. And I'm eager to jump on into this topic. Zach, how are you? I'm doing wonderful, Andrew. So to get us started... When you visit Discovery Park America, you'll notice that we have a very extensive military collection. Uh, We range from starting in the Civil War and going all the way to modern conflicts. So this includes World War II. World War II is very significant to our history in the way that, especially local history and Tennessee history, like you said, with Camp Tyson, um, it is very significant because any picture you look up D-Day, you most likely run run across the picture of a lot of the military ships surrounded by barrage balloons. What's interesting about that picture is those barrage balloons were manned by the 320th Anti-Aircraft Barrage Balloon Battalion. They were the only all-African-American unit to storm D-Day. They're also historically significant to this area because they were trained in Paris, Tennessee, or more specifically, Routon, Tennessee, which is just a short distance from Paris. Paris, Tennessee is a very short drive from the park, probably about 45 minutes to an hour. Anytime you see a picture of a barrage balloon, if it was made in the United States, it was made at Camp Tyson. So if you could imagine a small town almost every single day looking out their window and seeing these gigantic balloons flying in the air. Um, they were These balloons were called flying elef- elephants, uh, gas bags. They were also called uh, flying bombs because some of them were either filled with helium or hydrogen. And this is because their purpose was to send them up in the air to stop enemy planes from being able to see the troop movements. They would force people to fly higher and if they flew too low they could run into the cables that held these barrage balloons up and these balloons were very the cables holding were very invisible like you could hardly see them so these planes could run into those and if they ran into them let's say it's one with hydrogen well hydrogen is explosive so you can cause an explosion destroying the plane if they're filled with helium these are massive balloons i mean they're not, they're called flying elephants so If you can get an image of it, these were massive balloons. And when they fall, they could probably land on the plane and take it down just by, you know, stopping the engines and and whatnot. So Camp Tyson is very significant to, you know, the history of the United States for the simple fact that if you ever see a picture of a barrage balloon in World War II and it was made here in the United States, it's made at Camp Tyson. Camp Tyson uh, was a big facility for the time. 
Um, you're talking about a little country town of Paris, Tennessee, that was still suffering from the effects of the Great Depression. Well, with Camp Tyson coming here, the, the area was picked for one reason. It was picked because of how rural and how isolated it was. Um, the biggest problem that the government was facing at the time was spies and the enemy being able to attack the coastlines. So this was kind of, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, per se. This brought Paris. Paris basically became a booming town at the time. They had a little less than what the population here in Union City is, which that's grown over the years. So it's probably comparable to Union City now, if not just, just a little less. But at the time, it was a very small town. This town was big enough during that time period that they actually had a bus transit system in it. So that's you know fascinating for me because I you know I live in Martin Tennessee and just imagining an actual but like public transport bus system like what you would see in a big city like let's say Nashville or Memphis this was in small town Paris Tennessee so anytime people come to the park they see you know all our military exhibits and if they ever see a picture of that famous D Day picture you will see those barrage balloons which, again, were made here right in Tennessee, right down the road from Discovery Park of America. Zach, thank you so much for, for sharing that story with us. For those of you listening, uh, you can come to our military gallery uh, and, and kind of learn more about Tennessee's role in the various wars throughout the year. There's a lot of different stories to learn uh, and kind of how impactful Tennessee was through, throughout history. Uh, once again, thank you all for listening to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. And we hope to see you here at Discovery Park of America real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.